Black Man of the Now and His Family, Part 7. The pioneers and the prehistorians of East Africa archaeological findings were men such as E.J. Whalen, who used Uganda as the first East African area to gain attention. He was at the time director of Uganda's geological survey soon after the First World War. He worked primarily on the cultural succession and past climatic changes of Africa, identifying Kafun, pebble culture, presently discredited as being a human workmanship. His Sangon and Maigo Sion are names he selected from sites of the Khufu River, Sangho Bay and Mwanza in Yanza, Lake Victoria shores, including a waterhole called Magosi in Karamoja. Reports of the Geological Survey of Uganda and other journals by T.P. O'Brien, 1939, for discoveries by E.J. Whalen. A European warrior, Africana, settled in Mano Matapa, South Africa. Professor C. Van Rist Lowe, in 1952, published the first detailed account of Africa's cultural sequence. It was basically concerned with Nsanjizi on the Kajara River the most ancient of the prehistoric site known in Uganda today. However, the first European to visit this site was E.J. Whalen in 1930. Geologists W.W. Bishop and archaeologist M. Postmansky have also made extensive examination and rendered equally exhaustive interpretations of Uganda's archaeological past. During a 1926, a cultural anthropologist and self-trained archaeologist Dr. Lewis S. B. Leakey began the first scientifically systematic investigation of the Stone Age cultures of Kenya, East Africa. His first archaeological expedition was in 1926 in the Naraha Nakuru Lake Basin of the Rift Valley, where he noted that the climatical changes and effects shown in his works. He was assisted by E. J. Whalen and later on by the Swedish geologist E. Nielsen who was on his own investigation of Kenya's Rift Valley. In 1893, a geologist named J.W. Gregory noted that the formation of a large lake in the Rift Valley must have been in existence for thousands of years, accounting for the vast deposits of diatomite accumulated in the Kamasian encampment west of Lake Bongo and elsewhere. He also dated that the Kamasian Lake to the Neocene period. However, Dr. Lewis Leakey, hand axes were found embedded in the lake deposits, thereby giving rise to its Pleistocene age. In 1931, Dr. Leakey's books, The Stone Cultures of Kenya Colony, was published. In his works, the Black and Buren culture, hand axe culture, flake culture, and the so-called Mesolithic and Neolithic industries were given full recognition. With a period of five years, Dr. Leakey had unearthed skeletal remains older than any other man had seen before. These remains were unearthed at Common and Conjera in West Kenya, the Stone Age races of Kenya, 1935. In 1913, the late Dr. Hans Reck, a German geologist, unearthed a skeleton at Odalve, George, which was to him contemporary with the middle Pleistocene deposits. Later on, he found burial mounds in the Engorogoro crater, which also contained skeletons, stone bowls, and beads, but no Stone Age implements. In 1931, Dr. Leakey visited the old Dolby George and revisited it in 1932. At that time, which he found his astonishing skeletal remains. This discovery is today only surpassed by his later finding in Tanzania, East Africa. From here on, it was a field day for archaeologists and anthropologists, beginning with the 1935 L. Cole Larson find of fragments of a highly humanized skull near the shores of Lake Iyasi, not too far from the Odove George, from which H. Reiner created his new genus for Africanthropus, a name which soon lost acknowledgement. The Iyasi man, and the find was later called, was regarded as a relative of the Rhodesia Zimbabwe man, 
a fossil found at Broken Hill in 1921 by African and European miners in the area. In 1929 through 1931, Seton Park found the Archulio Savalasian artifacts, which is the most ancient collection of its kind from the so-called Horn, located at approximately 90 miles southeast of Berbera, Somalia, at an era at an area named Isutugan, formerly called British Somalia land, presently the Somali Republic. C. Barrington found similar collections in Northeast Africa during 1931. In the same year, A.T. Curley found some artifacts on the Hargisa Plateau, the prehistory of East Africa. Also, Wright Gordon Child, man makes himself. With respect to all of the scientists mentioned and those not mentioned, it is still Leakey's, doctors Mary and Lewis, who have made the most significant inroad on the average man so far as prehistoric man is concerned. Their unearthing of Zenjanthropus boys on July 17, 1959 on the slopes of Bed 1 of the Odovi, George, Tanzania, East Africa, a site known as FLK, had been to date the most outstanding find in the link of man as we know of him today and his prehistoric ancestors of thousands also millions of years ago. The type of man, Sir Charles Darwin Sr., the Victorian scientist, spoke about superior in his man-like qualities to Rhodesia, Zimbabwe man in every respect. It is in bed which contains Villa Africana fauna as well as the Australopithecines and the pebble culture which they produced that Dr. Leakey found his Zenjanthropus and Homo habilis entombed at its base. One can only imagine the extent of the work that was necessary to collect the fragmented fossils and the subsequent reconstruction and replace them in their original form. Considering the expansion and contraction caused by the bentonitic clay in which the remains were trapped for so many years at a level exceeding more than 21 feet below the top of bed one this substance bentonitic clay is approximately 40 to 42 feet thick at the point of contact luckily the bones were not distorted in any way even the fragile pieces of the nasals were recovered in almost perfect condition. Of course, pre Zenjanthropus type fossils were unearthed later on by Leakey, Lewis, and Mary, to which much of Zenjanthropus glory must pass. The latter fossils appear to have been much more intelligent by far. Note that this prehistoric fossil name stems from Zinjabar an early name of the Persian and Arabian invaders called the east coast of Africa, thereby Zanjanthropos, or man of Zanjabar, black coast man, boys, at the end is in honor of the financial sponsor of the many fossil searches in the area. Thus the name Zanjanthropos, boys, although the leaky spine is not the end to the link between man of the 20th century CE AD and his most ancient ancestors. It is evidence that sets Alcubilan as the apparent home of man's origin, the so-called Garden of Eden. Of course, not the Garden of Eden spoken of in the Hebrew Christian holy books, Torah, or Old Testament with the usual fig tree and forbidden fruit. It is the Garden of Eden, a man's evolution from prehistoric to historic Homo sapiens. Note that the glossary at the beginning of this chapter is meant to familiarize the reader with the terminologies used in this chapter. It is the student and general reader's advantage to secure an adequate dictionary for explanations of the anthropological, archaeological, and paleontological name of fossils, man generally. One should find this type of follow-up study extremely beneficial to the overall understanding of the scientific disciplines already named. It will also help one better understand one's own involvement in the universe as to the God and evolution arguments between scientists and theologians with respect to the origin of mankind. Following on pages 96 and 97, the maps and charts shown are for the express 
purpose of highlighting the saints or sites where fossil men or fossil men have been unearthed in Akubalan. In view of these locations where Boscot man, Zimbabwe man, Broken Hill man, Zanjanthropus boys, and all of the other fossil spine were located and unearthed, can one honestly conclude that Professor M. D. W. Jeffries claimed that said spines are in fact Caucasians or modern man, which he also called us, was rational. Equally, in looking back at the hypothetical maps by Dr. Widener and Dr. Churchward and Ben Jokonin, can anyone equate either of them to the facts presented on the maps and the graphs of pages 96 and 97? If so, ask yourself, why is it that the black studies and African studies do not face the issues pre-sentence here as racistically oriented with respect to their presentation by certain so-called orthodox and liberal white African historians, Egyptologists, and anthropologists. The bottom graph on page 97 shows a hypothetical chronology of the evolution of the fossil man to man from Lumers to Homo sapiens. The arguments on Adam and Eve to modern man, all of mankind, a religious hypothesis is equally as speculative. Thus both of these theories remain solely beliefs and not facts. One can only wonder how soon it would be if it has not yet happened when some discipline of the Jeffreys and Widener's lay claim to the above mind being the work of a shipwrecked Caucasian or Semites as they did with respect to the ruins of the Zimbabwe man. Of course it would be said that the Bantu's Negroes had nothing whatsoever to do with this operation but as in all of their own denials of the indigenous African creations and development done below or south of the Sahara. This too would equal the Grimaldi skulls, Boscot man, and the Xanthropus boys disclaimers. Historic quotations and comments about the Africans. This accomplishment brings the greatest honor to the black race and merits. From the viewpoint, all of our attention in the 16th century, the Songhe land awoke. A marvelous growth of civilization mounted there in the heart of a black continent and this civilization was not imposed by circumstances nor by an invader as it is often the case even in our own day it was desired called forth introduced and perpetuated by a man of a black race the above quotation taken from Felix Du Bois distinguished French authority of African original major work Timbuktu the Mysterious, in which he was describing West African societies and high cultures. When Arab merchants came to the Sudan about 1000 AD, they already found a well-arranged system of commerce when the Arabs first visited Negro land. By the western route in the 8th and 9th centuries of our era, they found the black kings of Ghana in the height of their prosperity. The comments we have just read were by the wife of the colonial imperialist who designed and developed the theory of indirect rule. Captain Lord Luger, her name, Lady Flora Shaw Luger, prior to her marriage, a newspaper writer for the London Times. The viral peoples of the Western Sudan have always been distinguished for commercial enterprise, masterful ardor, and aptitude for the art of government. From the happy combination of these qualities, there sprang a number of political states to which the Grandosi style of empire is often loosely assigned. None, however, can challenge the fairness of its implication to the great Mandingo kingdom, which is known as the empire of Mali or Mande, and it is sometimes called Melistine. The above comments were extracted from E.W. Bofield's Caravans of Old Sahara, page 67. Note that this work has since been revised under the title, The Golden Trade of the Moors. For my own part, when I fear that the Africans evil spoken of, I will assume myself to be one of the Granada. And when I perceive the nation of Granada to be discommended, then I profess myself to be an African. The beauty of the old English in which the above was written took nothing away from the manner in which the Leo Africanus described his beloved Granada, Spain, and praised his African origin 
as demonstrated in this book, The History and Description of Africa, translated into English by John Pori and edited by Dr. R. Brown, Hucklot Society, London, England. Forced to defend themselves against the raids and eager to break the coastal monopoly on the import of European goods, notably firearms and bonds of Dahomey broke through in the sea in 1724. They became a power with whom the Europeans had to reckon and soon learned to respect. The above was written by Archibald Gazelle in his book, History of Dahomey, London, 1793, page 60. Dazel was governor of the English traded station and castle at Cape Coast. He also spent four years at Quida, where he came into personal contact with the newly rising nation of Dahomey, originally called Dan Homey or Dan Homey. In Kilwa, there are many strong houses, several stories high. They are built of stone and mortar and plastered with various designs. As soon as the town had been taken without opposition, the vicar, general, and some of the Franciscan fathers came ashore, carrying two crosses in procession and singing the Titudum. They went to the palace, and there the cross was put down, and the grand captain prayed. Then everyone started to plunder the town of all of his merchandise and provisions. Two days later, the Almadia fired the town, destroying, as the account of the Boros explains, the greater part of this city of abomination. The above comments were extracted from Basil Davis's book, The African Past, page 136. It dealt with the city of Kilwa, which is still located on Africa's east coast. Note that the so-called Christian missionaries, particularly the priest and the vicar general, acted in this case as the only true heathens and uncivilized people. Or are we to assume that this is a Christian act to plunder and steal as long as the victims are not European style Christians. What a touching Christian happening that must have been. The Franciscan fathers came ashore carrying two crosses and led the pirates in prayer as everyone of the civilized modern men started to plunder the uncivilized Africa town of all of its merchandise and provisions. This is a befitting story of the type of civilizing and Christianizing that the Christian missionaries did in all of the conquered African nations and to a great extent still do. There is another habitation of Moors, two cavaliers shot from the castles, poor and miserable, which live by serving the Portugals. The women performs there the offices of tillage and husbandry and also of the Moors. They pay their tithes and Dominicans church the fortress was built in 1505 by Pedro de Enhaya with consent of the Moorish king Zufi, a man blind of both his eyes in both senses, external and internal, religiously and politically, who too late, repenting, thought to supplant it with treachery, which they returned upon himself and slew him. In the old times, they had pretty Moorish kings on the coast, few of which remained by reason of the Portugal captains succeeding in their places and in their amity and commerce with the Quintine king of these countries. The above remarks from the Dominican priest Joe Dos Santos, first hand confessions in his book Ethiopia Oriental, as translated into English, reprinted in Glasgow, 1905, volume 9, also in Jay's Pinkerton's A General Collection of the Most interesting voyages and travels volume 16 london 1814 and remarks we have noted that the word moors or moors is used to present all africans of the muslim muslim religion also called islam the father joe dos santos wrote that the earliest reports known on central africa by a european himself a dominican priest of the roman catholic church first visited Alcubilan's east coast in 1596 CE and served in Sofala until 1590 CE. He made extensive travels to Zimbabwe and Teti, also Manotapa, at the seat of the government in Zimbabwe, the Portugal called it Zimbabwe. Upon his return to Portugal, he remained approximately 10 years 
Some European writers contend that it was 11 years. He returned to Akubalan, which he seemed not able to resist, where he wrote his Ethiopian Oriental in 1609 CE and published it in Evora and was later translated into English. The Muslim inhabitants of the Kubalan, all of them, were called Moors before Dos Santos, yet the majority of these people of East Al-Kubalan were later called Swahilis by European colonists, historians, and called the so-called Christian missionaries. They did likewise during the same period Dos Santos wrote his work in which one can see a Roman Catholic priest first-hand recording of how his church representatives engaged in the rape of the African peoples and Africa. This is only one aspect of many reasons why this author labors so much on the history of the planting of Christianity, European style, in Akubalan earlier in his work. I, the Emperor, Manamotapa, think fit and pleased to give His Majesty all of mines of gold, copper, iron, lead, and putra which may be in my empire, so long as the king of Portugal, to whom I give the said mines, shall maintain me in my position. The above quotation was allegedly written by the Monomotapa on the 1st of August, 1607, through a Portuguese named Simones to the kings of Portugal. Diogo Simones, was the timekeeper and the archives of the Chronicle of India under Portuguese colonial rule. He was found in his post by another Portuguese, Antonio Bocaro, whose work was translated into English in Fields, Records of Southeastern Africa, Volume 3, 1900. This part of the work dealt with at least one aspect of the manner in which the Portugal and her colonist explorators, followed by other European and European Americans later, otherwise called explorers and discoverers, got wealthy by the way of gunpowder and the use of Christian religion, European style. Speaking about archives, the following data from the British Museum archive should prove quite an interesting point on which to examine certain truths as stated in the Hebrew Jewish Torah and Christian Bible. It is a document that was surrendered to the museum by the late world-famous Egyptologist Sir Ernest A. Wallace Bulge, who became the work's first editor. Note the striking similarity that exists between the papyrus titled The Teachings of Amen in Europe and Proverbs of Solomon in the so-called Bible book. Before reading excerpts from these two works, the reader must remember that King Solomon of Israel was not known to have written any literary work before mounting the Hebrew throne during the year 970 BCE, which was during the period of the 21st dynasty of Tamerian Egyptian rule. The papyrus, on the other hand, was found to have been written during 1000 BCE, at least 31 years before Solomon mounted to the throne of Israel in Palestine and before he was credited with writing the Proverbs. The following revelation should be of no surprise to anyone who has studied the religious history of Harabu, Hebrew or Jewish peoples from the time of Abraham to the beginning of the so-called Christian era. Those who have done research in this era are fully aware of the fact that the basic Mosaic commandments and deity concepts came from the training Moses himself as an African of Tymeri received the laws of the mystery systems while he was a boy and later as a grown man in Akubalan. This is according to the oldest documents about the Hebrew religion and recorded by Moses himself in his own book of Exodus, one of the so-called five books of Moses of the Holy Torah, otherwise known as the Christian Old Testament, any version. The above comparisons are but a choice few of the selected sayings of the entire so-called Proverbs of Solomon of Israel, which have been earmarked for the cross-reference. However, the entire Psalms, Songs of Solomon, and all of the Holy Torah generally are full of direct copies of works written word for word as their African, Egyptian, 
Nubian, Ethiopian, Marot sayings and teachings. This should not be surprising to anyone since Moses and most of the earliest Hebrews in Genesis and Exodus were all Africans. They were all born in Tamari, Ethiopia, even the Falashis, and Ta Nihisi, Nubia. Even the theory of monotheism, the belief in one God, above all others were taught in Egypt. Moses did not live until the reign of Pharaoh Ramses, 1340-1320 BCE, or Seti I, 1318 1318-1298 BCE. For it was during the period of the reign of Pharaoh Ramses II, 1298 through 1232 BCE, at which time Moses was allegedly more than 90 years old. That one is to hear of Moses receiving the so-called Ten Commandments from the Herobu, God, Jehovah, or Mount Sinai. The literal translations are extracted from very much older versions and less complex conservative texts than the presently revised versions of the Hebrew Holy Torah. Professor W.O.E. Osterley had been given the greatest amount of credit by leading scholars in this field with respect to his first-hand research and revelations of this particular point in literature, which influenced other noted historians and theologians to equally observe and examine the mythology of the certain alleged Hebrew origins. Besides the work of Professor Osterley, the following specialized bibliography on the comparative works Solomon and Amen Otep should be of particular benefit to the researcher and student who desire to delve deeper into this area of biblical history and mythology. As we continue our safari into the annals of Akubalan's colonial past, we find Sir John Harris explaining Cecil Rhodes economic motives in the following manner. It was the scientific gleam of gold in the rock strewn ground of Mataboland that forced Sir Star Jamason's hand and compelled him to invade the Matabel from Fort Victoria and as the effect of this impact upon the backward people has always been actually violent, coupled with bloodshed and cruelty upon the atrocious scale. The above remarks were extracted from Sir John Harris' Slavery or Sacred Trust, page 68, a work that reveals quite a lot of the ghastly acts of genocide committed by the European enslavers and colonist settlers against the indigenous African people, the so-called uncivilized heathen natives, for over 300 years. Sir Godfrey Higgins, Premier and Minister of Native Affairs of Rhodesia, addressing the Colonial Overseers League in London, 12th July 1934 stated, It is time for the people in England to realize that the white man in Africa is not prepared and never will be prepared to accept the African as an equal, socially or politically. Strange as it may seem, the racist colonists or imperialist murderers and masters of genocide who took turn in exterminating the indigenous African peoples often debased each other in the process in the following quotation from Williams Palmer, Cecil Rhodes, page 73, with respect to his conversation with Boer President Kruger's estimation of Rhodes, he wrote, Rhodes was one of the most unscrupulous characters that ever lived, no matter how debased, no matter how contemptible, be it lying, bribery, or treachery, all and every means were welcome subjects. If an African historian or any other kind of recorder had written this type of indictment against Adolf Hitler of Akubalan, Cecil Rose, it would have been rejected as a piece of unscholarly nonsense. But the same Cecil Rose is the man for whom the Rose Scholarship is named. This type of infamy is equivalent to naming a fellowship the Adolf Ekman Scholarship and offering it to Jewish students. Shamefully enough, African and other black students often accept Rose Scholarship. Sir Godfrey Higgins, already mentioned, had continued further with his express racism during a much later speech on March 30th, 1938, to his fellow white colonists, settlers at Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, called Rhodesia. He referred to the white settlers community as an inland of white in a sea of black, with the white artisans and tradesmen 
forming the shores and the white professional classes the highlands was the natives to be allowed to erode the shore and gradually attack the highlands to permit this would mean that the leaven of civilization would be removed and that the blacks would inevitably revert to barbarianism because of ancient control such as tribal authority had gone never to return leaving only the white man's law religion and example while there was yet time and space the country must be divided into separate white and black areas in the white areas the natives would be welcome but on the understanding that he merely assists and not compete with the white man native education should be by missions and not by the state till natives had a background of christianity sir godfrey higgins position of the early 1900s still expresses the general feelings common among the white men in Africa and to a great extent in the United States of America today and of course the same holds true with respect to the so-called Christian missionaries who will like to continue selling their European and European American version of economic capitalism and religious bigotry as Christianity. The contempt for the Africans, the natives, black skinned people became so intense that the certain white Jewish writers specializing on the so-called ghetto or inner city blacks themselves not too long removed from servitude and the racial scorn of their fellow Europeans and European Americans, the Christians and others have endorsed the following by G.C. Seligman, written in 1924. It would be very wide of the mark to say that the history of the Africa south of the Sahara is no more than the story of the permeation through the ages in different degrees at various times of the Negro ambushment or originals by hermetic blood and culture. One should be able to observe that the type of theories like that stated above by Seligmans are those that created the type of racist and religiously bigoted positions by Sir Godfrey Higgins in 1938 and Adolf Hitler earlier in 1936 CE. Such Recklessly loose remarks were still the order of the day and they still linger on in the works of the Professor Jeffries, Dr. Widener's and others of their projection at the present and the latter part of the 20th century CE. What is hermetic blood? It is possible that the black peoples of Akubalan sprang up from a mythical Jewish ancestors by the name of Ham and that the story shown on page 12 of this volume relative to the origin of Negroes is still prevalent view of the African peoples that frightened the President of the United States of America on busing and the white Jews on Forest Hills, New York City on public housing. The unquestionable fact is that the African black people existed thousands upon thousands of years before the first white man even showed up. Abraham was never heard of. African societies or high cultures existed an equal amount of time before the story of your Adam and Eve and the creation of the world by the Jewish God Jehovah in the book of Genesis, the first book of Moses, Holy Torah or Old Testament of the Christians. Source materials on this point are almost limitless, therefore no one who attended school should be ignorant of them, at least no professor of history or cultural anthropology should be ignorant of the existence of these facts, though it may be economically, socially, or politically more feasible to support the big lie than to teach the truth about the indigenous African and African people, the so-called Negro or Black African and his or her continent. And all of these violence perpetuated against the Africans and her indigenous people, Europe and European America, the United States of America particularly, still managed to speak in praise of a Kubalan's glory, such as James Montgomery poems of 1841 CE, one in which he wrote, Utterable mysteries of the fate involve, O Africa, thy future state, then through the night of these temperous years, a Sabbath dawn, O Africa, appears, then shall her neck from yours yoke be free, and healing arts to be hideous, arms succeed. At home, fraternal bonds her tribe shall bind. Commerce abroad espouse them with mankind. Ancient and modern European Asian Greeks, 
who worshiped and praised Africa, Africans did so orally as well as in their writings. Some examples of their writings is as follows. Plenty quoted an ancient Greek scene in his book Roman History written sometime between the years 23 and 79 CE. Thus, as Africa, Semper, a liquid, Novi. The English translation of the above quotation out of Africa comes something always new. Always of late, we speak of what the Arabs and Islam gave the indigenous Africans. Here we see the reverse as we read an ancient Arab saying, he who has drunk from the waters of Africa will drink again. In a similar light, we see the world noted. Literary great of Great Britain's Sir William Shakespeare saying the following, and it's Henry the Fourth, Volume Three. I speak of Africa and golden joys. The honored English physician and author Sir Thomas Brown, 1605-1682 CE, wrote the following: There is Africa and her prodigies in us. Sir Thomas comments were stretched somewhat by the following Dr. Victor Robinson, Arthur Seaver, Symposia, 1940, who felt obliged to say, it is one of the paradoxes of history that Africa, the mother of civilization, remained for over 2,000 years, the dark continent, to the modern Africa was the region where ivory was sought for Europe and slaves for America. In the time of Jonathan Swift, 1667 through 1745, as the geographers in drawing African maps would fill in the gaps with savage pictures where towns should have been placed with elephants. What town should have been replaced with elephants and where indigenous Africans were and are, they placed Semites, Hamites, Caucasians, Bantus, Negroes, Hottentots, Bushmen, and a host of other creations to satisfy their religious bigotry and racist hypotheses. By the writer of the book, History of the Nations, volume 18, pages 1, 1906, saw Akubalan in the following manner as he wrote, the African continent is no recent discovery. It is not a new world like America or Australia. While yet Europe was a home of wandering barbarians, one of the most wonderful civilizations on record had begun to his work, its destiny on the banks of the Nile River. D Negrosation of the de Africanization of Northeast Africa by so called white liberal and white orthodox authorities on Africa and Africans is shown in its major projection in the underscore quotations above. This is one of many reasons why black studies and African studies must remain under the control of European and European American white or Caucasian authority and the books of the early 19th century CE and before praising Africa and her sons and daughters must be suppressed in the favor of the moderate racist works by so-called white liberal Africanists who pretended to be the friend of the so-called Negroes allegedly on the premise that they too suffered like the Negroes and belonged to a minority. But the Africans are not deceived by any of these statements by any group, be they a minority or the majority of white America.